As Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took mankind's first steps on the moon, a third crew member orbited miles above them. Michael Collins, the Apollo 11 command module pilot. Collins was born in Rome, where his father, a career army officer, was stationed. Collins followed in his father's footsteps to West Point and then the armed services. But instead of the army, his love of flying led him to the Air Force. As an astronaut, he flew to space twice, Gemini 10 and Apollo 11. I wish I could have walked on the moon uh, undeniably. I, 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 I felt that way at the time. Still, I'm, I'm sorry I missed that. But I can say with the utmost honesty, I was thrilled to have the place that I had. Each astronaut, Collins, Aldrin, Armstrong, all leaving their own footprint on history. Just like all other Apollo astronauts, Armstrong lived in Houston's space community. The home in El Lago still sits there to this day. When Armstrong wasn't prepping for the mission of a lifetime, he was spending time with his family and his neighbors. And tonight, one of those neighbors is sharing never-before-seen footage with us. Corrine Poole knew the Armstrongs before NASA was even NASA. They first crossed paths at Purdue University in Indiana. We met in college. I was uh, initiated into Alpha Chi Omega sorority, and Jan was two years ahead of me, and that's where I met both of them. After college, it would be the Apollo program that would bring them back together. Corrine's husband, Jerry, a Boeing employee, was relocated to Houston's space community in 1967. When we moved from Seattle down here to Texas, um, the realtor that was showing us homes came into El Lago with us and they said, by the way, Jan and Neil Armstrong live here. And I said, oh really, we were sorority sisters. All those years later, they reconnected. We went to their house right down the street here and had dinner with them in the evening and uh, renewed a friendship. And then Jan talked us into buying this house. The pools were sold on the house and on living the space life. I eventually went to work at NASA too, in the clinic. Um, I'm a lab technician and I did all the blood work and stuff on the astronauts. The sorority sisters and their husbands became more than neighbors. They were in each other's lives. We ate at their house, played in the pool. They came here for dinner sometimes and that was just, you know, the friendship. A friendship that lives on, not just in her memories. When we first set out to tell this story, we canvassed El Lago to find people who had connections to the Armstrong family. Well, Corrine had connections, and then some. Imagine our surprise when she showed us this 8mm film canister. It says, Neil and Jan Armstrong, 1968. Where has this been for the last 50 years? It has been in a metal box with other film casing canisters, whatever you call these, on a shelf in our closet. And I have no clue where on this reel you'll find Jan and Neil. One of our producers took the film to a processing company to get it transferred to a format that would allow us and Corrine to view it. When we picked it up, never before seen footage of a serious space explorer enjoying himself on a sunny day in Space City. Corrine's reaction? Well, the word glee comes to mind. <laughs> Who's right there? Neil! Just a pool party with Neil Armstrong. No big deal. That's me. That's Neil. Corrine pointed out her sorority sister. <laughs> that's Jan. <laughs> and the Armstrong children. And that's little Mark. He's gonna do his thing. Armstrong, one year before he pulled off one of the most difficult landings in history, getting a tutorial on how to drive a motorized scooter from the kids. He's, he's learning from them how to work it. <laughs> a joy-filled flashback 50 years to the past, bringing up even more memories, like the time Jan wouldn't eat carbs. Just before he was to fly to the moon, they came over for dinner and Jan was on a diet because she knew she was going to be in front of the news. She said, oh, I can't eat bread. So she just had a plain hamburger, you know, and without the, the bread. But Neil ate plenty. <laughs> and I remember one time we were there at their house uh, in the backyard playing in the pool. And he said something about, I don't know how it came up. Jerry asked him what he did that day or something. He says, oh, well, he said, I took the lunar up, but it crashed. 
We said, what? He said, yeah, I crashed it. And he was just as calm about it. That was the day that he took that lunar lander up for the first time and it malfunctioned or something and he parachuted out of the thing. And he was just like, yeah, it crashed. I was like, oh my God. And how did she react when Armstrong made history? It's like, wow, my neighbor's on the moon. <laughs> I teased him later. We were at their house for a barbecue and the moon came out and it was a watermelon, you know, with the shape this way. And I said, Neil, you're the moon man. How come I've never noticed the moon with the crescent on the bottom like that? It's usually to the side. He said, I don't know. <laughs> An estimated 650 million viewers watched the first steps on the moon live, and KPRC played a major role in that. Our station started the pipeline that sent the video and sound into homes across the world. It's a connection that we are proud to have, and we are equally proud of the Channel 2 employees who made it happen. Our Phil Archer spoke with members of the team that made space and television history. It was the high water mark of the American century. A triumph of American technology and spirit. The culmination of a crusade that began in Houston seven years earlier. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. When Neil Armstrong fulfilled that promise, his one small step was broadcast live around the world on television. Beautiful view. Those dark, grainy images sent back to Earth were almost as much of a miracle as the landing itself. NASA spent a decade developing the technology to do it. The television signal relayed from the spacecraft's two onboard cameras to ground stations in Australia and California, and from there relayed to Houston's Manned Spacecraft Center, where about 60 KPRC technicians working for NASA helped broadcast it to the world. The station's planning was meticulous, right down to crew sheets and camera positions. Preparation for something never seen before in human history. You had to feel it. You had to feel it. You had to know this was something special. Bruce Bryant was a technical director. David Lavelle and Ron Putterman were both working as camera operators. All were in their 20s, all aware they were making history by putting on the most important broadcast of the 20th century. The whole world was looking through my camera. Suddenly realized what you were involved in. Mainly, we felt, or I felt, uh, uh, excitement. Uh, more, than, more than pressure, and, and just anticipation. Uh, just the feeling that, hey, this is, this is it. At the time, the world and the nation were in turmoil. The U.S. was fighting a hot war in Vietnam and a cold one in Europe. The Stonewall riots erupted in New York that June, and within a few weeks, Chappaquiddick and the Manson family would become household names. But at the Manned Spacecraft Center that summer afternoon, television brought the world together. Bruce Bryant punched the button that sent video of men on the moon around the world. One of them said, well, Bruce, in a minute you're going to uh, get a picture from the moon, and when you see it, just punch it up. I don't know. Oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh. And uh, pretty soon, that's just what happened. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. The mission control in the landing, or, or even approaching the moon, it was total silence. And everybody just holding their breath, just wondering what's gonna happen. And when the final landing and the, the lamb landed on the moon, it was just like, Okay, we can breathe, now what? Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again, thanks a lot. We were certainly holding our breath, and, and people around the world were holding their breath. It always felt like that helped cushion that landing. <laughs> Somehow, some way, they landed on our breath. They were doing a job, working around the clock, but still watching with awe, along with their audience, as Neil Armstrong fulfilled the dream of six million millennia with those now familiar words. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 
giant leap for mankind. And you just felt such great relief and joy and pride and all of that stuff. And everybody felt it all at once. The pictures they brought to the world tell the story, but not all of it. Beautiful. To That's feel beautiful. the magic of that moment, you had to be there. You did feel a connection with everyone around the world. And I don't think that since that moment, that, that uh, afternoon, afternoon in, in Houston, uh, the world has ever come together again like they did because everyone wanted them to be successful. Everyone was pulling for, for them. Still ahead, Houston after splashdown and the Apollo program. Things got kind of quiet. That was the first time I think I understood or heard the word layoff. Our space community grounded what it took to lift it back up. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavor. On clicktohouston.com right now, the moon landing brought a lot of firsts, including a cosmic coup for this local man. You're the first man in the world to touch the moon does with his bare hands. How one misstep on the moon by Neil Armstrong gave Terry Slezak this claim to fame on clicktohouston.com slash Apollo.